the uh, Lycoming Engine uh, plant with Michael Kraft, the uh, plant manager, I believe. Yes. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the history of this, uh, the Aviation Caucus, and uh, that's what we're trying to learn today, a little bit about aviation and WIM sport and uh, uh, what goes on here. Okay. Well, welcome to the plant first. Uh, very proud of this. We've. Uh, this location actually started uh, as well, a socialite from New York, relocated to the frontier, started up a plant making sewing machines and bicycles uh, close to 100 years ago. Uh, about the turn of the century, they started making automobile engines. At its peak, like Homing provided uh, automobile engines for a variety of vehicles, uh, close to 300 different models. At that time, the automobile industry was at infancy, hadn't gone through the kind of contractions. Uh, 1929. Uh, a gentleman named Henry Stinson bought the company because he needed engines for his newfangled device, the airplane. <laughs> and uh, at that time, the Lycoming came out with the R680, which was a six-cylinder radial engine, which uh, provided the power plant for many of the trainers used to train pilots during the World War II effort. We're standing in a section of the plant today which kind of has some pictures from that, that era uh, when there was a big ramp up uh, to support the war effort. And you'll see everything here. The majority of the folks were ladies uh, producing engines uh, for the war effort at that time. Uh, and that model of engine, I think, powered close to 38,000 aircraft by the time it was done. So this is kind of the starting point uh, for the history in aviation. We've been at it now for, it'll be 86 years producing aviation engines. Uh, brief synopsis, like homing power is probably 65% of the world's general aviation fleet. Uh, so we are powering aircraft in every continent of the world, uh, literally. Uh, we power the majority of the training aircraft for all the world's pilots. So when you get in the back seat of a 777 or even an A380 or 747-8, chances are the two pilots up front have trained on a Lycoming equipment they don't If you get into a helicopter, chances are really? those, <laughs> those helicopter pilots have trained with Lycoming engines. Uh, we also power, um, uh, you might have seen the Goodyear dirigible as it yes. went through Williamsport. Yeah. That's powered by three Lycoming engines. So that big Goodyear airship right now is uh, powered by Lycoming. So we provide, you know, it's, it's a very common engine. Uh, we don't power large aircraft, but we're mainly powering the small piston propeller and piston helicopter fleets. Yeah, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the aircraft that you talked about, uh, I'm sure that was here with Little League World yeah. Series. Yeah. So no, I, I've actually flown in that uh, when it was over in Austria prior to being disassembled and carted over here. But um, it's uh, you know we we provide a, a very unique product for aircraft. Mm. You know, it's not an engine that'll work in an automobile. They're designed to be very highly efficient, very compact, and very reliable, <coughs> uh, which is the reason why you know most flight schools choose like Homing, and actually <coughs> most heavy operators choose like Homing. And, and those engines are actually made. Here, 100 percent. They're made here. They're designed here. They're tested here. Our quality assurance is here. Uh, the only thing that we don't do here is is uh, air safety investigations. So we actually assist the <coughs> National Transportation Safety Board whenever we have to go out to do an accident. Uh, we have field technical representatives that support mm -hmm. all the aircraft in the field, both in the United States and in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, you know, Africa, Europe. And well, all those locations. So, well, as you said, it they're they're used all over the world. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people think of aviation as being, you know, recreational. You know, small aircraft as being a recreational product. Actually, uh, Lycoming powers the majority of flight hours logged by Lycoming vehicles are for flight training, <coughs> uh, for pilots entering into civil transport. They're for essential rural services. You know. Uh, so a great uh, Congressman Young from Alaska will remind you, actually he reminded me when I walked into his office in D.C., is that you people in the lower 48 understand we don't have roads between our cities in Alaska. Yes. So they get their food, their mail, you name it, via small aircraft transport. One of our biggest clients uh, run our engines actually do point-to-point -point medical transplants. So you literally have somebody on an operating table, they get the organ out, they take it, they put in a small aircraft and you're going point to point, yeah. which is the fastest way to be able to do that. So we, we power a lot of special mission aircraft. Uh, one other item that we do is we actually power one of the most highly utilized small UAVs or drones uh, to take picture hours for the U.S. military. It's sold on a fee-for-service basis, which I think you'll find interesting, <laughs> is that the military buys camera hours. We provide the engine to a sister company, and if they don't provide camera hours, they don't get paid. So it's entirely performance-based, and a lot of engine powers that. And I see that here on the tour as well. Yeah. 
So very proud of the history, uh, lots of technology behind it, and it happens all here from Williamsport, PA. The plant that we have is divided into two areas. There's a back shop, which is mainly component manufacture, and then an assembly area, which we put the engine together. We're standing in the midst of what's called the crankshaft cell area. Uh, we bring in raw forgings from the outside, and we do a lot of the specialized uh, treatment and machining processes on here. Uh, the, the machines that we're looking at right here are two Akuma CNC lathes. Wow. Uh, they run, before you install <laughs> them, about 350000 a pound. Wow. On that So on an installed basis, you can basically take that and multiply by 20 to 50 percent, and the overheads on it. But they allow us to do a lot of precision type work on it, and then we'll go to precision grind. But uh, the crankshaft, obviously, a uh, very important part of the engine, if you lose that, lost the engine and we pay a lot of attention to that here. Uh, this whole back area here will have, have several CNC machines. Uh, we recycle equipment, meaning these engines aren't like your automobile, you take it to the junkyard and they kind of take it for scrap metal. People actually reuse these engines over a period of time. We actually service product that was built three decades ago. Wow. Three or four decades ago. Five, five decades. I'm trying to figure out how old I am. I'm back calculating <laughs> right now, but we have equipment that obviously was we here put six, on the market. No. Yeah, here six. Actually, it could be six. Six decades. Do, do you build the actually do the blocks here also? Yes. You, yeah. So, so we bring in the castings, and you can actually see right here is these. So these are the actual, uh, you know, the equivalent of the engine block. And, they, and our engines are a little bit differently constructed than the automobile engine, where the cylinder is a separate piece from the main uh, crankcase. So you have the crankcase right here, and I'll show you the cylinders that bolt onto that. But the castings come in, and then we'll do kind of final machining and, and uh, assembly operations on these. Factory rebuilds come right in into the same line. Factory rebuilds the same line. So we recycle equipment, do new, new equipment the same line, which from a regulatory aspect, is something that nobody's achieved in the aviation industry. We've actually had folks like Snecma and GE, which are major turbine manufacturers, come in and look at the line and say, how did you do that? And uh, so from a procedural standpoint, we're, we're, we're at the top level of uh, companies in terms of what we can do here. So we're gonna walk over to another area, which actually you had a part in helping us Oh, facilitate. Okay. All right. The building that we're standing in right here is a, it's a special processes area where we do heat treatment. But what, one of the items that we do is ion nitride in the crankshafts. When you want to make a crankshaft really strong, you impregnate the outside with nitrogen. It puts a compressive stress in it, which I'm sure from a legal side you may not know anything about. <laughs> Aerospace no. is really cool. But our procedure before that before was to use ammonia. Okay. So we actually have ammonia plant on the other side of the parking lot. Ammonia is one of these chemicals, you know, the stuff that we'd like to get out of the plant, out of the neighborhood. So we replace this with an ion nitrogen, so it's a pure nitrogen process, much more environmentally friendly. This is the first oven to go in. Uh, this project here in this building was facilitated by Pennsylvania Recapitalization Fund. I think you had a hand in that along with, I think it started with Representative Capelli. Yeah, years uh, ago, and then I don't know, yeah, you're right, at the end of it, we picked up on it. Yeah, yeah and it made it happen. And what really that, that capitalization funding helped do, this building here is very environmentally green. So those circles there are light tubes, uh, which we don't use electricity to put light on. We use fluorescence for a little auxiliary. That big ducting there is waste heat from the compressors that we can use to heat the building at night. Uh, our cap funding really facilitated us getting this up and running, but also doing the investment to make this very energy efficient. That energy efficiency piece would not have been done if it hadn't been done with that Commonwealth we cap funding on that. Well, I, so, it, it's good to see the results of some of the yeah. things that we do. That's one of the things we talk about sometimes. I'm not sure we follow up and look and see what our investments have actually and, accomplished. And one, of the, and one of the major things that is accomplished here is that we put in one furnace, We've actually, in our budget for this year, are going to have a second furnace and potentially a tertiary furnace. So the amount of legs that that project had for us, uh, we did the planning ahead of time. We did the right planning ahead of time. A lot of legs on it. It's not only a more environmentally friendly process, it's reducing our energy footprint. It's making us more competitive for a very long period of time. So very, you can think of an example of a project that works well. 
you do the right planning, you don't think short-sighted, you use our own company funding and the RCAP, I mean, to, to be honest, the RCAP helped us take that extra investment beyond what we were going to do ourselves to take a look at a very long-term view and do things that we would otherwise not be able to afford, you know, and in terms of our typical company return process. Well, if it helps the business, especially here in Pennsylvania, and that like coming I mean, being the only division of your company in See, Pennsylvania, we like that. This here's a perfect example where we're getting performance out of it. Yes, yeah, that's what and, we're and talking that's, about. And that's, and that's cool. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And we put this in, and, you know, by the time we got this in and activated, we did the justification on one part, one process. We've now figured out, via the great guys that we have in the back shop and the mechanics and the engineers, we've now figured out how to apply that to three other parts. So it, it, is, it is just kind of, you, you get it in, you do it right, give them a little run room, and they'll find great things to do with it. So it's been a great project for us. So we're standing right now in uh, what's our piston manufacturing line. Uh, several years ago, uh, Lacoming was getting its pistons from a uh, Brazilian uh, forge and machining house. They came to us and said, you know what, aviation, uh, too intricate, too much liability for us. We're focusing on automotive. We're giving you so many years, you have to develop your own capability or find somebody else to do it. So at that time, we hunted around the world. We, never, we couldn't find anybody to do it. So what we actually did, we decided, okay, we're going to do it. So we uh, went out and we had uh, Cosworth, which is you know, from Cosworth Racing. Yeah. Cosworth is not only renowned for their engines, they're probably renowned for their ability to design how to make engine parts. So we went to Cosworth and we said, could you please design us a piston line? So we actually, they designed the piston line, we commissioned it in the UK, picked it up, right here. moved it to Williamsport, and what you there see you right are. here right now is you've got about 2.1 million dollars of CNC machine equipment over here, and then you have automated inspection equipment over here. So when this cell, by the time we're done installing it, commissioning everything else, not even qualifying the parts in the FAA, you're probably looking at about 4 million right here. Uh, that allows us to turn this thing into a final fully Form piston. Wow. And this is a high grade aerospace, uh, heavy silicon, aluminum grade steel. And one of the biggest things that we talked about spoilage and cash flow. Yeah. Before we had to buy these and keep these in inventory. Now we buy these, and one of these can make potentially four or five different parts. So based on what we need, we convert this piece of lower value stuff into the final piece here in Williamsport. Wow. And this is the lower value piece. That's awesome. So, and it's cash flow. Yeah. It's just pure, pure simple. And we used to get these overseas, which was six weeks ocean freight time. Yeah. So, That's awesome. So when I talk about the, uh, you know, the employees that we need to be able to do this, I mean, you're not talking about guys operating manual machinery. You're talking guys who are equal machinists and computer programmers. Yeah. Right? Working on equipment is that when this line goes down, the yeah. plant goes down. Sure. And then you're operating on lean inventory to be competitive. So, so you don't have much time between when it's down and when you can't produce product. So if you can be competitive against every other company in the world from Williamsport PA, but you've got to be bloody smart. So we not only employ, we employ here aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, manufacturing engineers, industrial engineers. You do the whole gamut. You do the whole gamut because you got a plant that's making stuff yeah. in aerospace. So it's a... It's All STEM a, science stuff. Yeah. We're standing here in front of the assembly line uh, for the plant where we run uh, new engines, uh, rebuild engines and overhaul engines down the same assembly line. The ability to do rebuilds, overhauls and new engines on the same line for an aircraft engine is, as far as we know, pretty much unique to Lycoming worldwide. And you talk about a cadre of folks that are from GE, Pratt & Whitney, Honeywell and that. And we've been able to do it here procedurally. To be able to do that, you need to, one, be very organized in your paperwork. And two, the skill set of the folks working here. This is not, I would say, typical assembly labor. You're talking about many folks who have an aviation mechanics background and training because they have to be able to put this engine together yeah. compliant with the procedures. Each engine is different. So we do 3,000 engines a year about, 600 different model variants within that 3,000. So we're a low volume, 
Pimex business of highly skilled people on what looks to be a floating assembly line. So that the wingspan on that is about eight feet. It's called the Arison NK47 Golf model. Uh, that's, that's the, the engine, engine right there. That's all of five horsepower and one cylinder. It's gasoline or it is uh, jet fuel, spark ignited. Oh. <laughs> okay, so the military lawnmower engine. <laughs> that is uh, a thirty thousand yeah, dollar lawnmower engine. <laughs> so it has to operate uh, beyond fifteen thousand feet. So fuel injected. Yes, direct injected. Uh, so this is uh, one of the heaviest used, heaviest use ISR air vehicle. But it isn't actually owned by the military. The military buys camera. Out. Is that so they, catapult launched or is yeah, that catapult launched and captured in the net? So it doesn't need a runway to be able to net cap net yeah. retrieve. So this is actually a picture I took in Afghanistan. So I I visited the guys out there uh, when they were doing that. Uh, this is now operating in uh, nine locations worldwide. Uh, many of which make Afghanistan look like a uh, vacation spot. Let me ask you, yeah. is this thing cranked to start it? Uh, it's actually, uh, no, you, well, or you it's have like a, a drill. Yeah, drill. Like you have yeah. almost electric drill, you put in, you yeah. turn it on and it cranks and goes. And then you step back from the catapult and it launches off a catapult and then goes out. I mean, look at the, the per precision in that thing, it's oh. amazing. No, it is. This is harder to build. This is a more uh, complex yeah, engine yeah, than anything else we make. It's like building a watch. Yes. That's exactly the analogy. Four it stroke? is two stroke. Yeah. So it's a air cooled, jet fuel, direct injected, right. two stroke, no uh, wow. beta control. Yeah. 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 So this How is how long can that fly? Uh excess of twelve hours. For the for the, the UAV, it flies for more than 12 hours, and uh, mainly doing base protection, but also uh, supporting SOCOM, Special Operations Command. For, you know, other That's amazing. One of the challenges when you get lean in production is that the plant is being used all the time, right? So maintaining it, you have to find a very small window of time to be able to maintain the plant without causing a major disruption. What's the uh, biggest engine that like coming next? How many cylinders? Eight cylinder. Eight? Yeah, we make an eight cylinder engine. We actually uh, produce four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder engines, both normally aspirated and turbocharged today. Uh, this area right here is our final inspection area where the engines come for, uh, they're off the assembly line. Uh, this area is actually run by the quality department. Okay, and the final inspectors actually are really the customer's agent in seeing that the engine is put together right, that the paperwork is correct, and everything goes because it's going into the box after this and then out to the, to the consumers afterward. Uh, so the culmination is this is the final spot before it hits the shipping dock, and then it's off to the aircraft on that. On the board over here is a number of companies that come in to benchmark us. Uh, you know, we re we've received some national recognition as a manufacturing plant for our, our operational excellence, uh, mainly the Shingle Prize. So we actually have companies coming in from outside the state and inside the state. Uh, you can see some of the names on the board right here that go through uh, to oh. do the benchmarking. Yeah. So everything from Playworld Systems just down the road to, uh, I think, uh, you know, Piper Aircraft, one of our customers, uh, West Pharmaceutical, which is unfortunately uh, has changed in the area there, Raytheon. So it's uh, Lockheed. yeah, Lockheed Martin. So we're, you know, we we've been able to do some unique things here in a small plant with a very high mix. Uh, Tobahani, uh, Tobahani uh, Army Depot was in, uh, also competing for the same things here. So what do you do for American Airlines? Uh, they came in to benchmark us, we, so we don't really? do any. We don't do anything for them other than they came in to say, "How do you guys do you do be compete competitive?" Yeah. So one of our items is that we talked about at the piston line is okay. 
got to be smart, got to be smart, got to be smart, hire the right people, and then you got to be smart. And, and that's really when it comes down to is when you want to be lean on manufacturing, avoid the spoilage. I mean, you don't want to have stuff sitting around. Be very efficient in terms of your cash management. And you just got to get very lean and mean. And these are the companies that come in and see how we got lean and mean in some of these areas. Yeah, this is our metallurgical laboratory. We obviously have a lot of quality control items, but we also have to be able to support investigative efforts when there's an aircraft crash. So what you have here is some of the most sophisticated metals and non-metals uh, material science capabilities with a couple of PhDs on staff wow. and folks that are very skilled in this, including uh, you know, two scanning electron microscopes yeah. with nuclear uh, type detectors to be able to determine down to the molecule what was in your steel or what was in your other item. So um, very specialized equipment. Um, I forget how much this one was, but <laughs> You don't, don't find, want to remember. You, you don't find too many companies in, in uh, Williamsport that have this. Uh, yeah, there's not too many that have scanning electron microscopes on that. Uh, and once again, the folks that we draw from, uh, actually one of our biggest target schools is Lehigh. Because Lehigh's material science program in ferrous metals, one of the best in the country. Mm. So just a, a real brief discussion of this area. This area here is all of our prototype shop equipment. Uh, most of the production equipment is on the other side, but here's where we do kind of a one and, and two type small pieces. There's a real unique piece of equipment over here. So this piece of equipment right here is an EDM machine, electron electro discharge machine machine, where a wire runs through and a little arc comes through and it cuts the piece of metal. Uh, another example of smart investment. We justified this product on one part, basically. Yeah. Brought it in, got the mechanics and machinists on it, and they said, hey, I think we could do this. I think we could do this. I think we could do this. Hey, engineering, if you redesign this piece, I think we could do this. Uh, and, you know, interesting piece, CNC control, modern technology, wise investment at the beginning, put it in, get smart people, and they find great things to do with it. Oh, this is YRDM. EDM stands for okay. Electrical Discharge Machining. Okay. I got that right. So basically what that does is you create like a, an arc between that wire and any kind of conductive material. You can't burn things that are non-conductive. You gotta be able to create an arc. Okay. And that on and off time, that spark erodes the material away. Okay. So as it sparks on, it takes a little bit of material and then it sparks off and it flushes it out of the way with water which is non-conductive, takes all the iron and stuff out, it has a filter system for that. So uh, that on and off time sparks and cuts material. You can cut really, really small intricate shapes. <clears throat> this is just a simple, this is for a DL120 project. That's only like 12 thousandths wide gap. That wire is 10 thousandths diameter, but you have, to, you have a curve there. You know, don't cut exactly the size of the wire, it cuts just a little bigger. But you can go down to like 4,000 diameter wire on that if you had to, for real small tight corners or something like that. So this was these holes were cut on that. These little slots in yeah. here. Yeah, you have to have a hole to thread yeah. the wire through. Yeah. You know that that takes a jet of water, and that machine will feed that wire right down through that jet and thread it so it goes right through and it comes out the end. You don't reuse it; it gets chopped up because it's spent once it goes through there. So. How, how thick of material can you, you cut, cut up to eight inches? But eight it goes inch? really slow. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it goes about ten or fifteen thousandths a minute. Okay. Each minute, that's all the distance it will cover linearly. When it's eight inches thick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but you can cut hardened steel on it, carbide. Uh, we cut um, CBN, which is like a diamond for our piston line. We actually make all the tools in house mm -hmm. for our piston line which we can control the quality. We've tried yeah, different, that was, that, di different dimensions to, to make it improve it, you know, which is nice that we can control all that in-house and not rely on, oh, we want to make a change, ship it out a month later, we get some tooling, oh, no, don't work. And then you can work on it today. Yeah, like if they come down today, we can tear down and, <laughs> and do it okay. right away. So it really makes it really That's efficient. Scott, we brought the piston line in, yeah. so, we, so we brought that in. And this then was we, tied then in kind of right to that. In source making the tooling for the piston yeah. line yeah. because we just couldn't have that chain of color. And the accuracy is pretty phenomenal with one of these machines. I mean, you're within a ten, one ten thousandth of an inch. 
you know, plus or minus. Okay. Usually this is where you ask for the next piece of machinery that you... That yeah, you, you guys want to... Do you have a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> water jet. We'd like to have a water jet laser. Oh, water jet laser? <laughs> water jet or a laser. Yeah. 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 Because sometimes, like, when you're cut... This is a real high accuracy machine. Yeah. But what's nice about it, it's unattended. Like, so if I had a, have a big job, you set that up and it wires, cuts on its own, you're yeah, operating right. another piece of equipment. Well, I'd just like to thank you for the tour. It's really informative, and especially for me, I mean, having lived in this area, and it's been a long time since I've been through the plant, it's a fantastic operation here, and uh, it's you and the employees of uh, uh, Light Coming Engines. I mean, it, you can be very proud of what you accomplish here. Well, thank you. Yeah, and th thank you very much for coming. We're very proud of the plant, obviously, and, and the employee base. Uh, we do a lot of, I mean, people don't really, may real, not realize what's here in Williamsport in terms of aviation industry. But uh, we're famous worldwide, and very much appreciate uh, your interest in coming in. And, we can do anything to help you understand aviation better, just don't hesitate to let us know. Well, it has been a big plus uh, as far as understanding aviation and how important it is to uh, the, the wind sport area and especially in Pennsylvania as a whole. So thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.